I'm going to go into the more formal part of this um, <laughs> okay. presentation, which isn't very formal. Yes. But, um, I want to welcome everybody to the Partners in Confinement series, ah. which is a collaboration between Marin Poetry Center and the Mill Library. And I'm Meryl Natchez. I'm the events chair for Marin Poetry Center. And I'm so excited that we have Cornelius Edie and Sarah Micklem here tonight. It's just so great to just see them. And, and I've enjoyed getting ready for this so much. So a huge thank you to Mill Valley Library. They host this event and it just wouldn't happen without them. And especially the city librarian, Angie Brenner. She is so supportive and Franklin Walther who just makes the technology seem so easy and is so willing to do whatever he can to make it work. And um, I also wanna give a shout out to the members of Marin Poetry Center because without them, we wouldn't be here. If you are not already a member, please think about joining. It's very inexpensive and you can do it on our website, uh, marinpoetrycenter.org. Uh, the fees of our membership is how we pay for all our events. And uh, while I'm at it, I'm going to put in a plug for buying these authors' books. Uh, this is um, Hard Headed Weather. I think that's your most recent book, Cornelius. Right, it is. It right? is. Yeah. It's a wonderful following. book. Yeah. I you. have uh, read it and reread it. I've had it since 2009. And uh, it's just really, I've not only read it and reread it, I've even stolen from it for. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's getting what we want to hear. <laughs> getting ready for this, um, I started and raced through Sarah's amazing book, Firethorn, which I would show you, except that I lent it to my daughter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. And I started on her second book, Wildfire, which uh, I bought from Abe. Ah. Oh. <laughs> And uh, they're both just completely transported me into another world of this, their witty and bold and often foolhardy protagonist. And for me, it was just the perfect escape for this moment. So it's a great time to buy books and those are great books to buy. Thank you. So uh, the way this works is it's really just a conversation between the um, All the things they're going to read and their bios will be in the chat. And uh, you can post questions there too. Um, we're gonna go for about 30 minutes of their chatting and reading, and um, then we'll have a short Q&A. Uh, if there are a lot of questions, I'll select a few from the chat and let the poets take it from there. And we'll be finished in time to go watch the rest of the Democratic Convention, which um, has been pretty amazing so far. Yes, it has. Uh, and, um, Hope there are more inspiring and wonderful speeches there, but let's get started here. Now I'm going to disappear, and you guys <laughs> are going to have center stage. Before you disappear, do you want to start us up with one of your questions, maybe? Oh, uh, well, my question is like, when you work, you're both, do you share your work with each other? Are you each other's first readers or not? That would be my first question. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, a good one. You want to answer the good question? <laughs> yeah, you start. <laughs> no, you start. <laughs> um, so the answer would be no, we're not. I have been, at times, I've been Cornelius' first reader. But now, especially that he's working on so much music, his first readers or his first listeners are his the two guitarists that he works with. And um, for me, my first readers, now that I'm s s trying to get back again, get my legs under me again and write some more, are I'm, I'm in a class with other people who were um, alumni of the class of Abigail Thomas, mm. who taught it in her apartment in Manhattan in the 90s. And we keep coming back and trying it again. Yeah. And we can't do it for very long because Abby's not teaching it. But we try to help each other out. So my first reader now is generally people in that class or my friend Kathleen, who's also in that class, but if the class is not going. Right. Yes. Sarah, Sarah's been my first reader for a long, was my first reader for a very, very long time. She really was. When I started, you know, my early, all my early books, 
um, you know, Sarah was the first reader for, for most of the poems and, and also most of the um, manuscripts as well. You know, not only, not only, not only did she, did she uh, what was see my editor in a sense for those books, she also designed a lot of the books, her other life as a, as a graphic designer. So I think it was more of a, a collaboration um, in my mind for those first, for those first three or four books. So yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's sort of surprising because I'm not a poet. You know, so you don't have to be. <laughs> so I don't approach reading his work as a poet. This is perfect, which is exactly right. Which is why she's a perfect reader because, because exactly she's gonna be looking at this in a totally different way as a as a reader, right? She's not gonna be thinking about it as uh, you know, where is the line that sounds like frost or where is the <laughs> you know, where's the reference to the she's just gonna she's just gonna read it and give me give me her honest um, feedback. And that's what most poets really want, you know, is that reader that knows them and will tell them the truth. Even if they don't like it. <laughs> I think what most people really want is someone who will read it and tell them the truth and say that they're a genius. Yeah, yeah. You know? Some people do, some people don't. <laughs> Cornelius is past that. Yeah. He's way past that. Well, you are a genius. Okay. <laughs> All right, the show's over. Yes. <laughs> but we, I, I don't know, did you warn people that that one of the people on this, this series was not a poet, uh, but a, a stealthy fiction writer. I guess that's okay. Um, yes. Yes. I'm reading tonight, what I read will be as close to poetry as I can get, sort of essay-ish. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. I mean, that's, that's really, you know, the, the um, the lyricism in your lines, I think, are you know, very close to poetry. In fact, better than a lot of poets I know. To the truth. <laughs> so, so I mean that that always been has always been one of the great joys of, of your work for me. So, one of the things that we're supposed to be talking about is life in the pandemic. Okay, so let's talk about life in the pandemic. So it changed for us. Uh, on March 15th, we left New York City to come and live with my mom in Long Island because she's in her 80s. Right, we're in Selma Riches right now, uh, which is like... Hey, they're in California. I know, I have, but some people have know about yes. Long Island, so I just want to give a sense of where Selma it is. Riches is, is west of the Hamptons right. by quite a ways geographically and by uh, even more in every other way like socially um but it's it's a we're so we're kind of in this house which is big enough for each of us to have an office including my mom and that's really great because in new york city we didn't have really my office was in the living room and since we started i started working full-time from home i work at girl scouts they shut down the offices on um, that weekend. On the Thursday, they told us to practice uh, staying at home, working from home and to take everything home. And then on, and they'd see how it went. And so we took everything home. And on Monday, they said, don't come back. Yeah. So it was all happening very fast. I'm sure that you all went through that too. And we moved out to be with mom because we really didn't want her to be shopping right. by herself or any of that so and it was it was necessary it was a good thing we did it uh and it helped us too in some ways but it's you know it's also hard to i i think we i felt that we were leaving new york city <laughs> this is weird but i mean <laughs> it's hour of need <laughs> yeah. not that long island wasn't having more covid cases in many countries yeah, I know. I know, you're right, you're right. But there is that, there is that feeling that once you're in New York, or you're, you're there as the ship goes down, right? Yeah. Right, right. I mean, we were, we were there for 9-11, so, you know, that, that, was, that was one of those things where you just felt you really were a New Yorker and you're going to tough it out, right? We did it. Yeah, this time we didn't tough it out. Um, but, but I think it was necessary, I agree here, I think it was necessary that we, that we came here. Uh, and I think it was the right choice. Though, I do miss New York, I miss Manhattan, 
you know, it's just one of those things. You know, you never get quite, uh, it doesn't get out of your blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, change in my work habit, obviously, was, you know, in my full-time job, now I'm doing full-time at home. So, I haven't squeezed writing into my life for quite a while, and I'm trying again. And that's been difficult because weirdly, I know some people have said they're less busy during this period, but I think people who have other people to take care of are finding they're more busy. So that's what's happening for us too. Yes, I'm more on, on Zoom these days. Yes. yes. <laughs> and Cornelius, of course, started teaching on well, Zoom. Well, yeah, started teaching on, on Zoom for the rest of that semester, the spring semester, and we'll start teaching again. Um, on Monday, you know, the return of, of, of doing, you know, uh, classes online again. I'm lucky in, in the sense that since I'm of a certain age, <laughs> I'm exempt from having to choose uh, whether I, I have uh, to, to go back into a classroom or teach entirely online. Um, and I, I, I consider that a lucky break because uh, I otherwise, excuse me, I mean, I have no intention of ever sitting foot in a classroom until there's a vaccine, <laughs> you know, it's just, not only is it bad for me, I'm a cancer survivor, I'm over 65 years old, et cetera, et cetera, but also um, Carolyn is, you know, in her 80s and um, has her own health problems. And so I can bring that, knowing that I could unintentionally bring that into the house, you know, so, so, so no way I'm, no way I'm getting a, in, into a class, you know, um, a physical class anytime soon. So, um, so that left me a lot of time to, to do other things. And um, like Sarah said, things shut down really fast, you know, um, in Manhattan, um, really fast for musicians as well, um, for everybody, but also especially for musicians who are living the gig life. Um, and um, we were going, my, my trio and I were going to go down to Nashville around Easter to uh, do a recording. Um, and that just evaporated <laughs> thanks to thanks to the uh, thanks to the virus, um, and we we couldn't figure out what to do next because we couldn't play together. We couldn't play together. We couldn't rehearse. We couldn't you know. So we had to figure out how to work. So this whole spring and summer has just been trying us doing a whole new way of, of interacting as a as a as a group as a band, um, which has worked out pretty well. But you know, like everything else, you, it's a, it's a new thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I ended up writing about 30 new songs, writing and recording about 30 songs. I call them pandemic uh, folk songs, you know, because that's, that's what they are, you know, uh, dealing with all the different ways it, it felt to, uh, feels to go through this, which we're still going through. And, um, you, you know, um, and, and, and so, we, so we wrote and recorded them and mixed them all online. Luckily, my guitarist, uh, Charlie Rao and Lisa Liu, uh, total professionals and they've got recording equipment and they know how to do all this stuff and mixing stuff so so we've been we've been just plowing on in that direction is this a good time to play one yeah sure <laughs> so as, as an example um how about one um there was a um there's a friend of, of mine that, that lives in uh, uh, uh was a poet in pittsburgh um and uh, she's a folk musician. And uh, we, we were emailing about the pandemic back and forth. And after a certain point, she had this, she had this tagline um, to, to end her emails. It was, it was, she, she said, don't get dead, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, DVD, right? Right, which was, you know, and um, we, 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 had, I adapt, we adapted it, you know, we, um, um, every week we have a, our, uh, me, and the, me and the band have a, a weekly, um, uh, you know, online meeting, band meeting, and, and we adapted that at the end of our knees, we say, well, don't get dead. <laughs> so after saying that for a few weeks, um, I decided it, was, it started morphing into a song. And, um, you know, so the song is Don't Get Dead. So you might go to play that. that. That might be a good way to, to start. Um, it's a hopeful song. It's not a bad pandemic song. It's one of those songs where, where, where basically you're, it's, it's like, don't get dead, hold out, get to the point where, you know, we get through this. No, that's not it. That's something else. That's a whole other thing. 
Is it there? If it isn't there, it's okay. Because, because what you were about to play was another, was another thing. As, as the thing about, about, about the pandemic is that, that, that it starts off as, 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 you know, of course, this thing about this virus and everything's going bad, and then it morphs into Black Lives Matter, right? You know, so, so, so George Floyd, um, you know, uh, and, and the reaction to George Floyd's murder um, sort of blends into. Um, and, and I guess what, you're, what you were playing is, um, is, is basically a sound um, uh, you know, thing that I did with a, with a, uh, with a, uh, with a sound artist uh, named Jenny uh, Johnson. Um, and um, I, and this, this happened because, because one of my old students from Sarah Lawrence College, um, when George Floyd was, was murdered, um, uh, um, Actually, uh, I think it's, I think it's Ahmed Aubrey. Yeah, it's actually mm -hmm. Aubrey, the, um, the person who was actually chased and shot in Georgia. And uh, my 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 ex student uh, emailed me and said, "What well, are you going to write something about this?" You know, and I said, "I was exhausted. I've done this so many times. There's so many songs I've written about elegies. I've written about African Americans being killed by the police and murdered by the police." And, you know, you know, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. I just can't do this anymore. You know, um, uh, uh, I've been so many of these too many. I actually put in the email. She wrote me back and said, well, obviously, that's going to be a line, whatever the next poem's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know? which, was, which was actually kind of funny because she actually, it was a nice moment in a lot of ways because that's exactly the kind of, of, of move I would have made on her when she was a, my student at Sarah Lawrence. Right? <laughs> I was said, ah, Deborah, now you need to take that line and turn it into a poem. So, so, so there it was, turned back, turned back in my face. So that became the first line um, in, in the sound design. Um, and um, I decided to um, take lines from other African-American poets that had written about this through the ages. And, and I called it and mixed that in with some of the, um, you know, the uh, news reports, um, uh, you know, f about that. And I, and I ended up calling it uh, uh, anthology. So it was so my line, but I actually wrote back to Deborah, of course, lines from uh, Lucille Clifton, from um, Sterling, Sterling A. Brown, uh, from um, uh, uh, blanking and blanking. I'm sorry. Uh, um, um, you, know, you know, a few other people. Gary Lilly. Uh, a few other people were, were, were basically uh, taking a line about that and then just combined them. And then Jenny put a beautiful soundscape um, to it. So that's that's what you were hearing. That's that's turns out to be the track called uh, Auto um, um, Anthology. You can play it. <laughs> you guys had it a second ago. I've written so many of these, too many. I've written so many of these. To oh, I've written so many of these. Too many. This is perfectly legal. I've written so many of these. So many. Too many. I'm a Georgia law. Guns are perfectly legal. So many. I've written so many of these. So many. Too many. I'm a 
I've written so many of these. So many. So many. So many. I've written so many of these. Too many. So many of these. Written so many of these. Too many. Written so many of these. I've written so many of these. I've written so many of these. Yes. So there you go. Um, you, know, uh, you know, that's my part of my summer vacation. <laughs> Jenny Johnson did an incredible, as you can say, soundscape to that. Um, you know, the, one of the one of the lines is is in Lucille Clifton's, which is, uh, you know, please please sorry that every day something something has tried to kill me. I didn't cut, I, and I cut out the last, the, second, the line comes after that, which is, and, and has failed, <laughs> you know, it, it just concentrates on something has tried to kill me every day, something has tried to kill me. And, you know, and, and so it's just that loops with all these other lines that are going on, and including um, uh, Ahmed, who's basically saying, who was stopped by a, um, um, 
a police, uh, two police in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a park a few months before he was murdered. Uh, he was just sunning himself in the park. And the line that, that came from the story was basically like, you know, you're, you're, you bothered me for nothing. So you know, just had to incorporate that as well. And then what's the line that says, in Georgia, it's perfectly legal? That's part of the, that's a news story by someone who was, who, who they, who was interviewed um, the, you know, about, about the story and, and said, yeah, you know, wow, you know, it's perfectly legal, you know, to, to, to carry a gun and- And shoot joggers? And, well, to carry a gun, perfectly legal. So, you know, all of that got incorporated into the track. So sorry, folks, not yeah. good video, but no. good audio. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah wanted me to, Sarah wanted Well, that, I think, so I, I think uh, it's about, <laughs> it's about what's going on and it's about, you know, how, you have to keep writing about it even because that's what you do. Yeah, I mean, that's what you do. Yeah. What else can you do? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've used up 27 <laughs> yeah. minutes. I know, it's pretty good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. But you need to read something. I feel like it's really un unbalanced here. You need to, no, it's, uh, I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read, Sinister. The right hand is the boss. It commands the gestures. It's bigger than the left hand in the brain where it counts. It expects the left hand to press the paper down while the right hand skates the pen over it. It expects the left hand to grasp the onion without flinching while the right hand cuts near the left hand's fingers. It expects the left hand to move out of the way one slice at a time. The right hand thinks it does all the hard work, but when it's sewing, it expects the left hand to be there under the cloth so the needle can aim at the left index finger because the hands can find each other without sight. The right hand never noticed that it's the left thumb that pushes the button through the buttonhole. The right hand thinks it owns the whole alphabet because it learned to write left hand might as well be illiterate. At dinner, the right hand holds the fork, the spoon, the knife. The left hand is sent to the lap to behave. Sometimes it's let out to hold down the meat for the right hand to cut, or to chase a few peas onto a fork, or to double the right hand's gesture. It moves the salt cellar when the right hand isn't looking. It fingers the napkin. It's always fingering. The left hand likes to dangle loose from the wrist while walking. The right hand likes to swing the whole arm. The left hand sleeps in a fist. The right hand sprawls over the belly. The left hand wants flesh. It nestles between the thighs. The right hand is brushing teeth and the left hand sneaks off, hooks its fingers into the pants and lies down on the small of the back for a while. The left hand is lazy. It's always looking for a place to hide. The left hand has all the bad habits. It likes its fingernails to be bitten, its thumb to be sucked. The left hand seems so cooperative and unassuming, but the left hand wants whatever the right hand has. The left hand reaches for all that. The left hand knows what the right hand is up to all the time. But the right hand never bothered to find out what the left hand was doing. It thought it knew. <laughs> I've always loved that piece. <laughs> so maybe you should title that um, White Privilege. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking of it as my, my post-colonial poem, but yes, exactly. Yes. Exactly. That's the idea. Um, so we have a question, um, I know I've had this question in the past, uh, what advice would you give to a writer who is somewhat afraid or shy to submit? There is so feeling of overwhelm when I look at all the many journals and quarterlies, and I know I've often had that feeling, especially early on in my poetic career, is like, how do you, how do you manage to submit? Mm. That's that's a good question. How's it how's it for you? I I'm 
I'm how, a good person how, to look at. I, I, I've only published two. I published two novels, which was a very big deal for me. Right. <laughs> And a few so short novels. stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I keep sending my short stories to the same people, Small Beer Press in Massachusetts, and they publish a zine called Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. So <laughs> that's how I deal with it. Like, they like my stuff, I'm going to keep sending it to them. Yes. I really, because I'm not looking for, uh, in the case of these stories, I'm not necessarily looking for a million people to read them. <laughs> um, yeah. Just having yeah. someone take them is, is really great. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so many ways of, of parsing that question, right? So I don't want to go on and on about it, but you know, but but you know, you you have to start thinking about what you want, right? Maybe another way of, of putting that. Um, if, if it's if it's just to be pompous, then that's probably ways of you know, you know, if, if it's to be famous. So we all want, <laughs> you know, we all want people to, to, you know, acknowledge that what we're doing is worth something. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you have to, I think you, you really have to, if it isn't working, you have to steal yourself, you know, so much of, of, of any art is failure, right? I, I mean, I, I, again, I don't want to sound like I'm the wet blanket of the two of us, but, you know, but, but, but that is what happens, you know, you, you have to get used to the idea that it's going to be a lot of times when things aren't working. Um, it certainly has happened in my life, you know, um, many times. Um, and, and it's just, it just, it just gets, for me, I just get thrown back on the work, you know, but, 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 but trying to keep your um, self together as you're trying to go forward. It's a, it's a complicated thing. I, I mean, you're not alone. You're not the only people, you're not the only ones going through this. Not, you're not going through it all by yourself. You, you, you know, there's, 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 um, you know, you, 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 you figure out, you know, you hopefully you, 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 you get to a point where you realize that that's what it is. If you really want to get out there, you have to just steal yourself and just do it. You know, and I hate that sounds, that sounds like a real bootstrap kind of thing to say. But, but again, it comes back to what do, you, what do you want, right? Well, all right. I can say from looking at your career that you never waited until the, like the, the big fancy journals recognized you. Right. You did not wait for that. You published, I mean, Cornelius's first books were published, his first two books were published by one woman presses. He is still publishing his chapbooks with a one woman press. That's true. Like he doesn't, He's not going to wait until the New Yorker acknowledges him, you know. Although you did have a poem last week in New Yorker. <laughs> he did. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was really nice. It was, it was, yeah, it, it was reprint, something that was, that was published a couple years earlier, which also was kind of sweet that they, they bring the poem back. But I guess, I guess, like I was trying to say, I, I mean, it, it, you don't, I didn't start at the top, as they say, you know, you know, I, I mean, you, you really have to slog. You know, and, and, and that's what it's been for me. I slog, right? Yeah. So, so, I think so, everyone slogs. Yeah, and every, I mean, yeah, I guess you're not alone. Everybody slogs. You're not, it, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it, but it's what you do. But I mean, um, the days when like there was, there was a limited outlets, those days are gone. I mean, there are so many places. It doesn't, so... I don't know. It's it's it is really difficult. It I don't want to. That's right. You don't want to. And yeah. I have I'm not a good example because I haven't persisted like Cornelius has. But um, even now in my genre, there are many many more outlets than there used to be in the genre of science fiction and fantasy. You know, it's not a small world anymore. And poetry definitely isn't a small world. And there, you know, the tastemakers used to be like a small group of people. That's not true now, I would say, yeah. from the outside. Yeah, I, I know one thing that helped me in the beginning was learning that Sylvia Plath's workroom was uh, wallpapered with rejection slips. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. And they were all right. Right. They all knew. <laughs> <laughs> They all knew what they knew when they turned the poem down, right? I mean, so that's the point, right? You, right. You, yeah, you, you're looking, you're finding that, you're, you're finding that audience, you're finding that reader, 
you know, and and it doesn't necessarily mean that 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 when when you get the re rejection letter that they are right about it. It's just it's, it's just that they have the ability to say no. <laughs> right? And I think Sarah's right. There's so many places to submit now. I think yeah, one thing is to find a place where you like the work, and start there. You don't need to start with the New Yorker where you're guaranteed not to hear back if for yeah. months and then yeah. get your rejection. Yeah. yeah. But 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 again, I was going to say, but rejection is part of the deal. Yeah, you, it you've is. Got to make, you've got to make peace with that on some level <laughs> if you're going to keep you going. Do. You do, and there's some writers I know who like as soon as something's rejected, send it right out again. I, I know that. Yeah, I know people. A lot of people that do that. They just it's it's just they don't take it personally. You just simply go. Well, I mean, it, it, it said that stops you from doing it. That's what I mean, right? Right. You know, you know that 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 you end up end up sending it out, sending it out again. I, again, I know a lot. Like we 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 probably have no some of the same people <laughs> right. that, that do that. Right. Yeah. So um, I have a question for the two of you, um, having lived in New York myself. Um, so New York is a very unique place with quite a lot of energy. And um, Long Island is a very different place. And I'm wondering how that was for you in the change. Well, we don't, I mean, think about the time is such that we don't go out. So it's very inward yeah, time. That's right. It is for yeah. Cornelius especially. I'm I am the person in the household who has been doing the outside chores. Until mom started going to doctors, which she's had to do over the past yeah. once the peak of the epidemic was closed, she was finally I mean was over. We she was finally able to start going to get some necessary things attended to. Mm -hmm. Um, but for a while, you know, I was trying to go out once every two weeks right. or once a week and doing that, in, you know, that intense, like, decontamination <laughs> procedure when I came home. Yeah. Well, was, was not yeah. going out at all. Yeah, that was because why something. would more yeah. than one of us, I mean, yeah. it just seemed like yeah, you know, I was the right. one who had the best shot. Right. The healthiest of the three of us, right? And, but also, you know, you think about, about how that idea of contagion was so deep. In the, in, you know, in, in the early days of, of the pandemic, because mm -hmm. like, you didn't know, or you were getting all this, all you were right, all you were getting is all conflicting information about what it was. First, you didn't have to wear a mask, but then you could wear a mask. But then you know, it, it, you know, you didn't have to worry about it being on a surface. But then you had to worry about it being on a surface. I mean, it was like all this different stuff throwing at you. So it's this idea of, of, of contagion became a came your came our um, you know our. our, our, our are, 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 are larger, larger here. You know, the president came in and lived with us for a while, and, and a lot of other places too. You know, you this idea of just walking out the door. Um, I actually had to go out to do some banking um, for Cobb Econo, um because I'm an officer of the board. Besides being the found, one of the co-founders, I'm also an officer of the board. So, so we needed to do some some banking that couldn't be done any, any other way. And I drove into town. I drove into Brooklyn and, and just, just thought about all the different ways I could have blown it, <laughs> right? right? You know, I couldn't find a place to park, so I had to park in the parking garage and the guy comes out, did he wear a mask or didn't he wear a mask? I can't remember now, right? You know, and he takes, and he takes the keys and he takes his hands. So what, and how many people has he seen before he saw it? It all comes in, your brain starts to start to just yeah. feel with that. I, 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 I did, and, and, and then am I bringing it back here, right? I thought I did, I took all the precautions, I wiped the car down, I wiped the keys down, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but you know, what if I blew it and what if I'm bringing it back, right? It's just, it just it's just, that's the way we live now, right? Or, or, yeah. But it was really intense in the spring. It was, you know, it was, it was really that, that way. I, mean, I think it would be that way if we were in New York. Too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, well, if you, if we've gone in there. We haven't seen our friends. Yeah. You no. Know, yes. It's just because we, we just can't risk bringing it back here. Yeah. Well, let's shift gears for a second. And, and before we're done, I'd like to hear a little bit about the origin of Cave Canem, how that started. I'm just, what's, what's the birth story? Well, that's a long story, <laughs> you know. But 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 two of the people who were principals are here, so you know, Sarah's as much of a co-founder uh, as, as me and Toy, uh, and uh, you know, the, you know, the Reader's Digest version, right? Yeah, you got to condense. Yeah, yeah, I really got to condense it, right? Right. The Reader's Digest version <laughs> is that we were all on 
uh, vacation um, on Capri. And then we took a, uh, and, and uh, we started talking about this thing. This is Toy Derek. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yes. Right, right. And we're, Listeners out there. Right, for the listeners out there, right, right. I'm sorry. I mean, because then we're going to lose some details because we're doing it so fast. But, 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 but you know, but basically, um, Toy talked about this um, idea she had tried, um, and it didn't work out. Um, I had thought of the same thing um, a, a few years earlier. In fact, I had a conversation with somebody who would end up being in the first um, um, class of Cobb Econom. We were both teaching at um, Sarah Lawrence College. And we were both you know, frustrated and saying, why can't we just have a place for, 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 for poets of color, black poets? Why, why is it so difficult? I mean, you know, usually when a conversation goes on, it usually dies when you get to who shall pay for this, right? <laughs> 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 right? I mean, that's where it died. I mean, we were, I remember distinctly, we were at B. Smith's, the old B. Smith's in, you know, Midtown, and, and we're talking about this we, oh, oh, at the bar. We were, we're, you know, we were, you know, sort of, you know, boosting ourselves up, and then, well, who's going to pay for it? Oh, well, <laughs> so, 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 so there was the conversation again with Troy, you know, um, you know in, in, on Capri, and 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 again we were we got to the point where we started thinking about it, and then the, who still pay for this, and started to lose energy, and then Sarah broke the knot by simply reminding us that you know why not pay for it out of your own pocket. So, wow. so, so that started the ball rolling, as they say. So this was almost twenty-five years ago now, right? Yeah, this, this is our twenty-fifth year. And yeah. um, how different was the landscape for black poetry at that time? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm only laughing because I had a I had a, a committee meeting this afternoon, of uh, uh, you know, and and we were we're talking about this, and we were talking about the, some of the perception problems that Cobb Economy has you know, that now is seen as kind of like an elite kind of place where you know, <laughs> right? You had to watch out when, when, who we look at. And I was thinking, I was I was thinking 25 years back as as that was being said, right? Where, where there was nothing, <laughs> where it was right. a desert, was absolutely, you know, I mean, it was just the landscape was just, it, you know, so, so it was a nice way of measuring how far things had actually come, that you could actually be in a, in a meeting where basically we're talking about, you know, the, you know, you know, we're the right, whether we're the establishment. <laughs> You know, when when 25 years ago, that was not even that that was you know the thought that that we even get to this point, uh, it still astonishes me, you know. Um, so it was it was different, <laughs> you know. And I'm glad we've had some effect. I really am. I think if um, if anything, um, uh, that's one of the things I'm most proud of is is you know, you know besides getting married, <laughs> you know, um, was 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 that uh, was, was that we I contributed we all contributed to something that actually seems to have changed um, the equation a bit. Really? Know? Yeah. Yeah, so, I think you definitely did. Yeah. And it changed. And it was an equation that needed change. So yeah, yeah. yeah. a big contribution. Well, on that note, unless you have anything more, I think we are coming to the end of our event. <laughs> that was we quick. just talk a lot. Yeah, we talk too much, clearly. Oh, no, 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 it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. <laughs> maybe, too we could, too fast. Yeah, I know, maybe we oh, could oh, go oh, out oh. with a song. What do you think? What? Well, sorry? Maybe we could go out with a song. What do you think? Sure. How, do, 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 you, do, you, do you have the, um, excuse me, ice cold cherries on the back porch? Franklin, I'm going to ask you that question if you can. I do. A nice summer song. <laughs> Thank you.
guys so much this was so thank much fun you. it was yeah. lovely to hear you both thank you thank, thank you, you for the so invite we, yep. we really enjoyed it, <laughs> it thank great. you <laughs> Good night. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. take care bye bye, bye.